someone confirm if there is a sound or a little now? Yeah, um, so I would like to give you an overview about the camp area. Um, here, um, this royal picture was taken in 1945 and 40, um, and it shows you um, the complete concentration camp area. Here you could see uh, the so-called, officially called, protective custody camp. You um, can recognize two rows of barracks where the prisoners had um, to sleep but to work too. And you could see such a C-shaped building, the so-called maintenance buildings, where the prisoners had to work at different workshops. Um, but around here you could find another area which was much larger than this prisoner camp, the so-called SS training camp. And if we have a look to this side here now, uh, we could see the former headquarters area. On the right, the so-called commandantur, the commander's officers, and on the left side are some garages where prisoners had to work too. There was a huge bakery, for example. So this area consisted of different um, yeah, buildings, factories, and um, the SS guards, the officers, were trained here, not only for um, the deployment on this ground here, but for the deployment at other concentration camps as well as, for example, Auschwitz. So, uh, if we turn around now, <clears throat> we could see um, a further remnant, a small railroad track and such a ramp. And uh, most visitors have a certain image in mind seeing these railroad track. And the most believe that the deportation trains of prisoners stopped here and the prisoners were driven out from the wagons. But this railroad track was um, yeah, not used for deportation trains during camp time. Um, it's a small remnant of an old powder and ammunition factory built in World War I in 1916. After the First World War, the German government was not allowed to produce weapons and ammunition any longer, and this huge factory, which consisted of 200 buildings, was abolished. But the infrastructure was perfect to implement a concentration camp as soon as possible. The first prisoners were shipped to this camp by trucks on 22nd of March 1933. These men were political opponents of the Nazis, uh, communists, leftists, Social Democrats, Socialists, um, but some Liberals and Conservatives too. Later, more and more um, different groups of prisoners were deported to this camp, um, as uh, we will see. So, um, here we can see such a road and the new arrived prisoners had to march here on this road and they had to enter the so-called protective custody camp. Um, the so-called protective custody camp marching through this gate. And here you could find the notorious slogan um, Arbeit macht frei, work sets you free. And this notorious motto was quite common in the German concentration camps. You could find it in Auschwitz, of course, but you could find it at the concentration camps Sachsenhausen as well as in the concentration camp Flossenburg. Um, so uh, the building in front of you was officially called Schurhaus, so-called Dayhaus. Uh, the Schurhaus was a military term. So we are going inside now. The 
The Schur House here is quite authentic. This building was erected in 1936 and uh, it was built by prisoners. Um, at this time, in 1937-38, uh, the prisoners had to dismantle the former ammunition factory, the first concentration camp, and now they had to build a new camp, an extended and modernized camp for housing around about 6,000 prisoners. <clears throat> the concentration camp Dachau was the first um, large systematic camp of the Nazi regime and it became a kind of model for all of the concentration camps which were erected later. And um, this one was the only one which existed for nearly 12 years, from March 1933 until the 29th of April 1945. It was liberated by two American divisions. And um, the camp developed, as we will see, um, at uh, the situation in this concentration camp escalated, especially during wartime. So uh, we are standing on the roll call ground now. And as you can see, this roll call ground was huge. Um, it was built for around about 30 to 50,000 men. And um, here we can see the Schur House from the interior side. And if we have a look uh, to the top, we can see one of seven towers surrounding the camp. Um, this was Camp Tower mm, yeah, A. And the machine guns of uh, the SS guards targeted to the raw call square and um, along the electrified barbed wire fences always. And the SS was trained uh, to shoot immediately um, without and ordered to shoot immediately without any warning. And the guard duty number six of the so called disciplinary and punishment regulations, a brutal punishment code for prisoners and detailed regulations for the SS guards said if a prisoner attempts to escape then he is to be shot at without warning. No guard who has shot an escaping prisoner in the execution of his duties will be punished. And this shows you the arbitrary ruling such a camp. Uh, this camp here was an absolutely lawless area. Um, in the upper floor of this sure house, you could find the offices of the so-called protective custody camp leaders. And these SS officers were crucial for the prisoners because they were in charge for so-called camp punishment. Um, camp punishment meant torture always. For example, prisoners had to stand here at attention for hours, but for days too, without anything to eat or to drink. But this was just one type of so-called camp punishment. Uh, if I turn around now, um, we could see such a propaganda photo showing us <clears throat> um, a roll call. This one here was published in 1938. And um, yeah, um, the prisoners had to stand here in the morning and at night for one hour at least. But such a roll call could last uh, the complete night too. And the prisoners had to stand straight as an arrow. Then the so-called capos, functionary prisoners, ordered them to slap their caps um, against the legs in unison. And um, after some while, the order was given, 
caps on and then they had to put the caps on their hat and afterwards they had to march to the work details inside and outside of the cap. One of the prisoners, a um, French one, Robert Antelme, a French writer who was active in resistance um, and arrested in June 1944, he was deported to the Buchenwald camp first and arrived in Dachau in April 1945. Uh, described the situation, the impression here, when he came to Camp Dachau. The sun shines white, the sky is murky, the large camp square is dipped in blinding light. Barracks all around, the men run in all directions. We are herded together into a corner of the square. We lay down on the ground. There, where we lie, the ground is infested with lice. We are like flotsam, left to dry out in the sun. Sometimes prisoners had to listen to a kind of welcome speech. Um, um, the concentration camp commandant made to the new arrived inmates. For example, Josef Jarolin, he said, you have no rights, no honor and no protection. You are a pile of shit and will be treated as such. So, um, um, after standing here, the prisoners were driven to the so-called uh, registration procedure. Uh, they were driven to the shunt room. So we are going to the maintenance building now. This one was erected in 1937-38. Uh, it is uh, quite authentic, or some parts are quite authentic. And now uh, we are going straight to the shunt room. On the left, uh, you could see two barracks. And um, these barracks here are rebuilt in 1965 when the memorial site was opened. Such a barrack, uh, built from wood, was built for housing 206 prisoners in 1938. But at the end, when the camp was liberated, 500, 1,500, 1,700, or near 2,200 were cramped together uh, in the barracks. And that means the camp was completely overcrowded. 32,000 prisoners were cramped together in this camp. <clears throat> yeah, um so we are entering um, a workshop now, the so-called High Frequency Department, and today you could find our permanent exhibition in this former uh, maintenance building. But we are going to the shunt room now. So. Um, this model, work sets you free, was um, just cynic, of course, because work had always punitive character. Prisoners were not freed by good work or high productivity. Um, and, as we will see, there were releases in the 30s and some in the 40s. But, um, yeah, work was a method of genocide, of uh, extermination as the Nazis called it at the end.
Yeah, uh, we are standing in the shunt room now, and uh, shunt means prisoner transport. It's a military um, yeah, term too. And here you could read uh, Rauchen verboten, no smoking. Smoking forbidden. And uh, this inscription here is original. And so let's see if it makes sense here in this shunt room. And Edgar Kupfer Kobowitz, a German political opponent of the Nazis, described in detail what happened here in November 1940. Edgar Kupfer Kobowitz uh, emigrated to Paris in 1934 and to Italy in 1937. That Italy was a fascist dictatorship and allied with uh, Nazi Germany. So uh, the Italian government extradited him to Germany, and Edgar Kufakovowitz was deported to this concentration camp. And he had to work as a kind of camp clerk in a factory on the SS uh, training camp, and he managed to write a secret diary at night. He survived and published this diary in the 50s. So he wrote in November 1940, square columns supported the ceiling between them the tables that divided the whole room into two parts. Signs hung above the tables, A to K, L to P, Q to Z. Standing behind the tables were a few men with shaved hats, striped clothes, and intelligent faces. Our particulars were once again taken down. In the background, an SS man shouted, Move on, faster. The SS man who escorted us here ordered, Andres, come on, get going faster, clothes and underwear, everything in one pile. We were all naked standing at attention naked, that seemed like a bad joke. Yeah, it is a bad joke, standing naked near a window. The prisoners had to hand over all belongings, all assets. And now the prisoners were registered. Here you could find a complete bureaucracy of terror. So, um, these this picture, taken in May 1945 after liberation, shows you some so-called camp clerks, functionary prisoners. And these prisoners look so different uh, from prisoners you, or survivors you might know from textbooks or documentaries. These men are not starved, they are healthy, and some of them are allowed to have longer hairs. These men were functionary prisoners. The SS implemented functionary prisoners to control the other ones, uh, to discipline them, and um, such functionary prisoners got better rations, got privileges, better clothes, better food, and own bad, but they had to participate in murder and in torture. Um, these camp clerks had to register the new arrivals. They had to write down um, name, profession, religion, etc. And now you could find a set of stamps. Here, for example, the stamp release and lesson. Uh, yes, during the 30s, prisoners were released, were periodically released. But um, there was a problem, of course. If a prisoner was released, he could tell. So um, a released prisoner had to sign a document and he had to commit to keep silent and to report to the local police station where he lived. Then you could read Überstedt. That means transfer to another concentration camp, as for example, Sachsenhausen concentration camp near Berlin. And you could read invalid transport. That was a sentence of death. Prisoners being incapable for work, unfit for work, were selected from the other ones and were deported to
to Hartheim Castle near Linz. Hartheim Castle was not um, an extermination camp or concentration camp. It was a death facility of the so-called euthanasia program. And, um, and um, these euthanasia program um, facilities were erected to murder um, feeble-minded, mentally ill patients and handicapped persons, but even uh, prisoners being unfit for work. And um, the administration personnel of these facilities developed the know-how for gas murder. And some of them became concentration camp commandants of extermination camps later. Here you could see the link between the euthanasia gas murder program and um, the extermination camps erected during the war. So, um, next, um, we have a quick look to this picture here um, because it shows you that <clears throat> there was a lot of propaganda. Um, this cover of the, London Illust uh, of the Munich Illustrated Press shows you our uh, inmates in the concentration camp Dachau. And um, so the existence of this concentration camp was well known in German public. Uh, Heinrich Himmler, the chief of the SS and commissionary police president of uh, Munich in 1933, announced to the press uh, that the concentration camp Dachau would be opened uh, for housing political opponents of the Nazis. And the media started to publish articles about um, the concentration camp. Even foreign delegations of short journalists were allowed to have a visit, a guided to, through this concentration camp. So um, next we will see that the prisoners were numbered and were marked with different triangles. <clears throat> So, um, here you could see such a placard hanging in the concentration camp offices, in the SS offices. So, each prisoner was numbered, but the numbers were not tattooed as in Auschwitz. The numbers were tattooed in Auschwitz only. Here, prisoners had to sue the number on the uniform, and <clears throat> they got a triangle. They were um, stigmatized. So, red means political, political opponent. Green, so-called professional criminal. The professional criminals were ordinary criminals, but anyone with a previous criminal conviction could be deported to a camp from a prison, for example, without being sentenced, again, without a new trial. Blue means German immigrant. Um, Germans who had tried to escape the Nazi regime, but the immigration quotas of the different countries were extremely strict, uh, and very often um, these persons had to return to Germany, and they were so wheeled and deported to the camps now. Violet. Violet means uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses uh, refused to be conscripted to the German army, and they refused to, be, to make the Hitler's salute, so they were seen as, um, yeah, 
uh, public enemies and put to the camps and think homosexuals. Homosexuality was forbidden in a lot of countries at this time, and it was forbidden before Hitler's seizure of power. And, um, but the National Socialists considered homosexuals as um, a kind of perversion, um, yeah, perverts, undermining the so-called people's community. And last, so-called anti-socials. Um, the anti-socials were a very heterogeneous group, uh, which consisted of hobos, homeless people, so-called work shy, the poor, um, yeah, drug addicts, um, drunkards, prostitutes, and so-called gypsies. And, um, of course, yellow, Jewish. Uh, around about 50,000 Jews were deported uh, to this concentration camp from 1933 until 1945, and 11,000 were murdered here. That does not mean that the rest did survive, because um, many Jewish prisoners were transferred to other concentration camps, as, for example, extermination camps, and were murdered here. During 1938-39, um, during the Second World War, more and more foreigners were deported to the camp, and the foreigners were marked with the letter of nationality in the triangle. So, um, there was a ranking. Um, and there was a yeah, hierarchy of prisoners. The prisoners being on the bottom were the Jewish prisoner, as well as Russians, Poles, and Czechs, the Slavs. And on the top, the German prisoners, the German political opponents and so-called professional criminals. These prisoners were considered to be Aryans superior to the inferior races, and that meant that they were implemented as functionary prisoners. But we are going to the bathroom now. <clears throat> yeah, um, so, um, this um, showcase shows you some shaving instruments and a little yeah, painting. It shows you functionary prisoner, so-called barber. And this man is shaving another one, perhaps a new arrival. And the scenery looks extremely harmless, but um, what happened here was extremely yeah, harmful, was extremely dangerous. First prisoners... First prisoners um, were sh shaven. And that means that not only the head hair was shaven, but the complete body hair. And um, the reason was uh, humiliation. Yes, you could find such posters, such placards hanging at the concentration camps, warning the new arrivals and... Um, of the prisoners, eine laus dein Tod, Vorsicht, one laus your death, attention, in different languages. But um, the dangerous lies were sitting in the uniforms and not in the hairs. And the SS physicians were not interested in prisoners' health, they were interested in their medical experiments only, um, yeah, exploiting prisoners as guinea pigs. So, um, after shaving, the prisoners had to step in a bell filled with disinfecting liquid, and then they were driven to this room here, the so-called bathroom, 
and were forced to take a shower. If a prisoner was lucky, he got a piece of soap and a towel. But very often, the SS um, used the showers for maltreatment, turning the water to ice cold or boiling hot. Um, next, the prisoners got uniforms, and here you could see an original one that's a winter uniform, not a summer one. Um, very often, there were no sizes, and um, so the uniforms were ill-fitting. And here you could see some shoes. The prisoners got wooden shoes, um, pants, a pair of underwear, such a jacket, and a cap. Standing in front of a well-dressed SS officer, they looked like clowns, as Stanislav Samachnik wrote in his book, That Was Dachau. So um, there was just a pile of uniforms, and the prisoner had to cross what he could get as soon as possible. Um, after this procedure here, this um, arrival procedure was finished, and the prisoners were driven to the barracks. But this room here was not only um, a shower room, it was a room uh, of so-called yeah, camp punishment. Here you could see some holes, and these holes were built for crossbeams. And um, if we turn to um, this, Painting, you could see what happened on the cross beams, the so called pole hanging. Prisoners were handcuffed and hung on poles, as you could see here, or on cross beams uh, for at least one hour. And the SS could always find a reason for so called camp punishment. For example, um, a spot of coffee on the dishes. So um, here we could see some original dishes as for example a cup or a spoon and this picture here taken in summer 1938 shows you a prisoner locker. It's a propaganda photo, but it tells some truth. Yeah, the prisoners got um, aluminium dishes, and they had to clean and um, to polish the dishes shining like silver. And Edgar Kupfer Kubowitz wrote in his diary that one stain on locker's wood, one spot of coffee on such a cup here could mean one hour of pole hanging. Yeah, um, are there any questions? Yeah, then we are at the end of uh, this tour about the arrival procedure. I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, and um, yeah, if you need any further information, so have a look on our website and here you could find some uh, yeah, videos, some documentaries, and some um, texts of survivors too. Thank you very much, and goodbye.